Welcome to a CNBC Africa special. My name is Arnold Quizera. You can follow me on Twitter at The Real Quizera. Today, we are going to be having a conversation regarding science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, commonly known as STEM. Now, if you notice uh, at the World Economic Forum earlier this year, there was a lot of conversation regarding Africa being able to leapfrog into the fourth industrial revolution. We're going to find out more about that and why is STEM the topic of conversation or why can STEM take us to that fourth industrial revolution. You are watching CNBC Africa, follow us at CNBC Africa. Now, introducing my panel with me today are two distinguished people in the STEM field here in Rwanda. On to my left is Alice Ikuze, um, if I pronounce your last name properly. Uh, she is a mechanical engineer and a tutor at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, Rwanda Center. And to her left is Bob Rugamba, who is also uh, a person in the Ames Network, and he work, and he's the current ambassador for the next Einstein Forum, who is saying his farewell <laughs> as ambassador for the next Einstein Forum. But uh, I want to start with Alice, ladies first, they say. Um, just yesterday, you took home the award of Rising Star uh, in the next Einstein Forum Science Week, Rwanda. What does this mean? Oh, first of all, I want to thank my colleagues who nominated me for a Rising Star Award. Now, that award means that the work that I'm doing matters. It empowers me to do more. Uh, and uh, also, it gives me more motivation to promote women to do and to encourage them to do STEM subjects and fields also to, call, to pursue a career in STEM. Well, you organized uh, this uh, Rising Award. It's the first time it's being uh, handed out. Second, Second time it's being Second. handed out. Uh, oh, when you look at the impact it had, the first time, wh why is it important? Well, uh, specifically about the Rising Star Award, is, uh, we're looking at uh, the younger generation of women in STEM and the work that they're doing. And we want to highlight the work that they're doing so that we can encourage the next generation. You see, something about most of the things that we do is that people want to be able to see themselves in the, in the fields that they aspire to join. So when you get people like Elise, who are not very far ahead of the next generation of, science, of scientists, and you highlight the work that they're doing, then you're able to encourage others to, to do the same. So last year we had the first edition of the award and uh, we, we gave it to an innovator, really. Uh, this year we're giving it to not just an innovator, but also a research scientist in the area of energy. And we believe that by highlighting the work that these very phenomenal women are doing, will be able to tell the younger generation of women that it is possible, you can actually do this. Alice, uh, I want to come back to you regarding that issue because you've opened up our conversation and there's a kind of worms there in regards to uh, women in STEM. Now, there's a belief that science is an element for women. There's, when you're in school, boys are persuaded towards the science field. I did science as I ended up here. <laughs> well, women and girls are not encouraged as much to take up sciences. Now, if you could start with your story of how did you get into mechanical engineering? Oh, <laughs> yeah, you are right. Um, but uh, some people did do think STEM is not meant for women. It's difficult to say they can't do it. But uh, now we can see there's a change. Many women now, they're doing STEM, starting by myself. Uh, I did mechanical engineering. Uh, I, was a, I was lucky because uh, my parents encouraged me when I came there, I come at home with the idea of doing engineering. But I didn't want to do mechanical specifically. I want to do something like electrical, civil engineering. So when the head of department told me that, Alice, no, you want mechanical engineer, I said, no, 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 no. I can do engineering, but not mechanical. <laughs> so um, at the end, I went back home. I had discussion with my father and mother, and they said, no, you are smart, you can do it. Oh, so I look at them the way they believed in me, then I said, yes, I can do it. Then I went back to the head of the department, I said, yeah, no problem. 
I've been in mechanical engineering. Uh, Alice says it's belief uh, that made her go there. Uh, do you believe uh, that the reason we don't have as many women in STEM is a lack of belief that they can do it? There is there's certainly a, uh, a bit of that. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's multidimensional when you see why we have uh, fewer women in STEM. There is the fact that they are discouraged from doing it because they are told it is difficult. Uh, they, don't have, uh, they don't have the capacity for it, which is myth number one. But also there is the way uh, certain STEM fields are projected that are irreconcilable with women. I'll give you an example. Growing up, when they talked about a computer geek, I saw a guy, okay, in a room, completely unkempt, okay, with lots of dirt around them, and that was the image of computer geeks that we had. Now, for most young girls who are taught to be organized and neat and clean, they cannot reconcile that image with what they see themselves being. They don't see themselves living in filthy environments and being unkempt and the rest. So there is the element of belief being told you cannot, but then there is also sometimes the way certain STEM fields are projected. So uh, someone who wants to be neat and organized and smartly dressed doesn't see themselves fitting the stereotype that has been created about uh, a certain STEM field. But as time goes on, you see that changing. You see. Uh, when you have someone get into the field and make it now, people are able to identify themselves with that person. And then it starts breaking those stereotypes when you realize, oh, by the way, I can be a scientist and I can be camped and organized and smart. Then you start to relate with these fields. I want to start with you, Bob, there, right? And I want you to give us a solution of what can be done differently to have more women in STEM-related fields. Uh, first of all, we need, uh, we need to see more role models. We need, to, we need to get people like Alice and take them to the younger generation and break the stereotypes about, uh, uh, that, that society have towards women and STEM. Uh, I know very many women who are successful in STEM fields, but then they're also successful at home. One of the biggest misconceptions is that you cannot be an engineer and a homemaker, and that is absolutely wrong. Uh, that, is one, those are, that is one of the areas that we need to uh, to talk about. The second thing that we need to, to look at is how STEM itself is perceived. We need to, uh, to break the stereotypes around STEM. Things like geeks, computer geeks look this way and behave this way, that scientists don't have a life okay, outside of the lab, that they cannot be fun, that sciences are difficult and boring. We actually need to show the younger generation a better picture of the scientists so that they are encouraged to join uh, the sciences. The other key thing that needs to be done is you see an improvement uh, in very many institutions when it comes to, say for instance, you go to university, you find there is a higher number of girls in computer science. It was the case in my class. Uh, but then beyond that, beyond the, beyond the undergraduate, when you go to the STEM fields or to in PhD and beyond, or to the research labs, or to industry, the curve tends to go down beyond that, okay? So we need to ensure that industry is, is built in such a way that it encourages women not to drop out. Because if they've gone all the way to, to undergrad or even to masters and they've studied the STEM fields, why don't we see them transitioning into research? What is it about the research fields, the PhDs that is discouraging them? And we need to have those conversations and we need to have universities and other teaching institutions or research institutions doing more to retain their female talent rather than losing it to other fields. Alex, I want to come to you. He, he's talking, he talked about mentorship initially. He's talking about retaining of talent. Uh, wh what do you think about those two things, the need for mentors to have more women in STEM? Yeah, I do agree with him, uh, especially to encourage young generations, especially young ladies. We need to have the role models. I wish I had a role model when I was starting mechanical engineer, so that that person could tell me, look at me, I did it, you can do that. Yeah, but now, <laughs> yeah, that's why we have created an association, which is LAWIS, one association for women in science engineering. Our main purpose is to encourage young ladies to do for STEM. So we are giving the, we are providing them the role model by 
doing outreach. Where can go there? Some of them they want to do maybe physics. We have the physicists who have already a PhD. If they can look at her and say, wow, she did it, why not me? But every, before, like in 10 years ago, they were going to motivate them, but they are men there. Say, no, he's a man, of course he did it. But once I'm in front of them, I said, I was like you in high school. What, what, what role, and uh, Bob, I want you to point on this question as well, what role can funding do, deliberate funding, uh, help in ensuring that it's a balanced outfield? Oh, first of all, I think they have to be sure that the environment and the work, a working and studying environment caters for their different needs. It's really important. Because some of them, they want to do STEM, they want to do studies, but they don't have means. Or some of them, they have families. So do you believe that government should take, should governments or the people in the field should have deliberate funds, maybe set up a fund of just women in STEM fund? Definitely. Bob? I agree with her. And uh, here, here are some of my reasons, okay? Uh, there is a, a funding bias, okay, in most of the funding institutions. Where, for instance, if, if we submitted applications uh, for research funding, okay, and uh, we did not indicate our genders, okay, there is a very high possibility that we could, we are at par when it comes to... Oh, what, what, what would you do with the names? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Usually, because that creates the bias, okay? Now, when we put our names on it or our genders, if someone picks the proposals and is able to say, this is a woman, then all the land and accumulated gender biases start to set in. So she could be denied funding, not because I am a better scientist, okay? But because she's a woman. Now, if there are, is deliberate research funding that is going to women in certain STEM fields, then that is going to increase the number of women that are doing research in the STEM fields or that are working in the STEM fields until that point where we've been able to overcome our biases. And these biases are a work in progress, okay? Uh, one of the things that cause some of the subconscious biases are the current statistics where you see where you see more men than women in these fields and it makes you believe that, oh, maybe there are more men because they are better at this thing. That is not true, okay? So as we begin to achieve parity in the numbers, then we start to break some of these biases and stereotypes. So in the interim, maybe as things change, it may no longer be as necessary to have uh, funds that are dedicated to women, but right now for us to break certain barriers, it is very important. Uh, Bob, just this story, right? Uh, sorry, just this week, uh, I read a story about a one Dr. Muyembe um, from the DRC, and he is actually the person who discovered the Ebola virus, right? And his story was never told until recently. W why is it so important in terms of getting funding to tell the story of African scientists? You know, there's, uh, there's uh, an old adage that he who pays the piper dictates the tune. Now, most of the funding that is coming in is coming from external sources. And for as long as those sources are telling the story, they'll tell the story how they deem fit. And that is why it is not just important for there to be funding, but it is important for there to be African funding. Because if, if for instance, the government of DRC had been funding Dr. Miembe, then chances are higher that they would have gone further to even invest in telling his story. Because for, for such a milestone discovery in the health uh, sector, you would want to, to tell the story of the progress that you have made. So it is very important that we not only get funding, we also make sure that the funding is African because then we can, con uh, we can control the narrative around uh, the discoveries that we're making and the advances that our scientists are making. When we look at, um, uh, Alice, when we look at that issue that a person like Dr. Miembe faced, whereby the story was, they went ahead and told the story that someone else discovered the virus and he was written out of history. 
but most importantly was denied the funding access. What solution do you think we can have for that? Um, first of all, I would think of something like a network where we, give, we, have, we have chance to expose what we are doing. That's when people they come to, and to appreciate our works. Secondly, uh, there are sometimes we need to publish our works so that the whole world can know what you are busy doing. But the problem is you might find like we need money also to go to those high, high journals. So if you don't have fundings, we don't be able to publish your work. So your work will never be known outside. Bob, I want to come back to you. Uh, and Alice, I should also point on this question. Um, research and development is very important. And uh, we're going back to that issue of getting to the fourth industrial revolution as a continent. Uh, and Africa as a continent only contributes 1% of, of its GDP towards research and development. How do we change this attitude towards R&D? And first of all, why is R&D important? Well, R&D is very important because uh, when you look at most of the solutions that uh, we import from elsewhere, someone invested in the R&D for those solutions. So it is very important because it is from that that all the solutions that we have today have come from. Now, if Africa is going to leapfrog, if we are going to stop being importers of solutions, then that means we need to invest in R&D. The problem that we have is that sometimes I think we look at the short term. If I commit this million dollars, can I have a solution tomorrow? We are not thinking about, can I lose some money today? Do we have that luxury with our political la landscape across the continent? I think we do. Uh, I think we do. It's, it's really about uh, prioritizing. And in certain cases, everything is a priority in, in, in some of the African countries. But also, the question now becomes, how do we work together? Because if I have a limited budget and, uh, and I am maybe I have so many other priorities, how do we come together? For instance, how does the East African community come together and create an R&D fund? Okay, where all the countries are contributing and they're all benefiting equally from, from the research or from the products that are coming out of this. So th there is need for us to understand that we cannot always be importers or purchasers of solutions. We also need to start looking at how do we benefit from this very big cake. Alice, I want to come to you and I want to look at the current situation. You're dealing with students on a daily basis now. Um, but I want to go a lot younger than the current age group you are dealing with, right? Do, do you feel like right now is the best time for a young person to be studying STEM? Uh, and do you feel like the landscape and attitude towards STEM-related fields uh, and education is changing? Yes. Um, uh, is it a strong yes? Or? No, it's a strong yes, and I want to <laughs> tell you, you why. Uh, let's say, take example, the maybe second, I mean, the primary school. When they are studying doing mathematics, that's when they are studying problem solving. Because you, uh, they are starting doing some drawings, mapping them together, look at what am I getting. So that's when they are developing their thing now, say, okay, when he's drawing those figures, can say, oh, this is mathematical problem solving. That's what you're doing. So I think it's, the, it's a good time to encourage them to do science by showing them or teaching them how they can be used in real life. For example, when they're doing mathematics, you can tell them, when you go at home, you use mathematics, especially even your mom, even if she's not educated. But when she's cooking, she has to know that if you have one kg of rice, you have to put maybe a half of small spoon of salt. They didn't do mathematics, but they know to do rations so that they can get better results. So, <laughs> so I think it's a, starting at the earlier age is the is best solution to encourage them to do science more than starting at high school or university level. It will be difficult to tell them why it's important. Well, you wanted to, yes, please. to chip in on, uh, on that particular thing. You see, our foundations are laid when we're young, okay? The passion that you have uh, for some of these STEM fields is built when you're young. 
my passion in engineering was built when I was a young boy, watching my father do some of these things. Uh, I, had, I have a big sister who wanted to be a medical doctor. Her passion was built watching my mother who was a midwife as a child. Okay? When I got to school, I almost lost it at one stage because of uh, a mathematics teacher who harassed me. But eventually my foundations as a mathematician or my passion for mathematics was again built by a teacher in primary three and primary four who was very passionate about mathematics that he made me fall in love with mathematics. And so you start early, you build it into them and then they live for it. They, they want to chase the dream and achieve the dream. So uh, I want to stay with you and I'm going to come to someone who's in the teaching field here. Yes. You've hit <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You've hit it on something very important there mm -hmm. of the role a teacher plays. Do you feel like we need education reforms first of all for our education syllabus uh, in general, uh, all the syllabi? Mm -hmm. And secondly, do, do we need to reskill the current set of teachers or any of the teachers regarding their attitude to how they put out that information? Oh yes, it is. Uh, well, for, for the curriculum, I think we've already seen, in the case of Rwanda, we've already seen uh, uh, the Minister of Education move to a competence-based curriculum, which I think uh, is a step in the right direction. Um, the next step, however, is uh, equipping the teachers, uh, both with the requisite skills uh, for for training these students for instruction and delivery, but also in uh, attitudes. Uh, it is not uncommon to find that uh, the teachers have an attitude of, for instance, believing that uh, girls cannot do STEM or they cannot do well in STEM. It is not uncommon. I remember um, when I was in high school, my mathematics teacher was not very good at English. And he used to say, oh, we, we scientists aren't good at English. But who says a scientist can't be good at English? They're, they're completely unrelated. So we need to have them change their mindset, even on the sciences. Stop telling children that sciences are difficult. Sciences are doable. They're not difficult. And uh, that, is, that is one side of it. And we've, we've seen some of it being done, for instance, by the AIMS teacher training program, where AIMS is going down to interact with the teachers, with mathematics and science teachers, and give them the requisite skills, help them. Recently they, in, they did uh, industry visits where they sent uh, teachers and students to various industries. And the aim was for them to see how science is applied in, in, in these industries and help the teachers get real life examples that they can use in class to explain scientific concepts to their students. But then they also took the students along with the teachers for them to see how science is working in these industries. And just uh, the importance of this is that sometimes it is easier to understand certain concepts if we can relate to them. Just like the, the cooking lesson that you just got. Uh, relatable. Absolutely, it is relatable. You will understand mathematical ratios a lot easier when they tell you if you're mixing your agasha juice, you need this amount of water and this amount of juice to make a perfect mix. But you just learn ratios in mathematics. So. Uh, that is why we need to do some reskilling and some retraining, but also to change how uh, STEM is taught to something that is more relatable, something that is more practical. Education reforms, do you believe in them and do you believe they should happen sooner rather than later? Uh, I do believe they can, can happen, but as he said, when teachers or educators, they don't believe in what they're doing, then it's going to affect students automatically. First of all, we who are helping students, we should first of all understand and know why we are doing what we are doing. As he said, if you are saying like, mathematicians are not good in English, for someone who has nil primary one, he will go and say, oh, okay, it's fine, I can just speak in Rwanda, I don't have to know English, As a, I'm going to be a mathematician. So now, from the earlier age, now he has that problem in, in his mind. Then it will be difficult to change. So I think it's the, now the right time to change if we really want to see the young generation grow up with different mindset. Okay. Yes, guys. Final words as we wrap this up. Uh, your, each of you is going to have a minute. So exactly <laughs> a minute. Um, do you believe Africa can 
uh, catch up with the fourth industrial revolution, or in fact lead the fourth industrial revolution? I'll start with you, Alice. Yes, we can. What we need is just to put more effort and believe in what we're doing. What kind of effort? What can we do differently? Well, starting by, as a researcher, starting by research, and then also focusing on uh, mainly look at the evolution of other countries. I'm not saying copy and paste. They look at what we have as natural resource, which can help to catch up with them. Because we have a lot of natural resource, but you're not using it efficiently. How, how and I'm sorry if I come to you, Bob, how can we use the, our strength, uh, which I believe is strength in numbers, right, of tapping into uh, a Nigerian mechanic, a Kenyan uh, researcher, a Ugandan computer scientist, to come and form uh, that our backbone in STEM and distribute this wealth, this knowledge of wealth across all our African countries. Why, how can we tap into that? We, ha we, we first have to work together network and networking. For example, a researcher in Rwanda, if they can meet in the, with the researcher from Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, they can share their ideas and come up with something amazing. But we, yes, but we are working separately. We are our four selves are not putting to, are not together to for one unit. We are just working for our own problems. Inward, we stop inward looking and do more outward looking. That's at least Bob. Can we lead the, that f direction to the fourth industrial revolution? I strongly believe so. And one of the reasons is that uh, some of the problems of the future are today's problems in Africa, okay? So that would mean we, we have a, a more hands-on uh, experience. Uh, I'll talk about energy because that is one of the fields that I'm most passionate about. Whereas, uh, whereas countries like, countries in Europe are, are, are grappling with what happens when eventually we need more energy than we are currently generating, it is a problem that today is happening in Nigeria. So you see researchers leaving Europe coming to Nigeria to do research in this particular field. How do you manage a very scarce resource? Uh, for, for years on end, they've had more energy than, uh, than they needed. So that gives us an upper hand for us to develop the solutions for tomorrow. The challenge here is that rather than harnessing uh, the opportunity that these challenges uh, present, we've continued to look inward and now it is um, it is the Europeans that are now coming here to study the challenges that we have, create the solutions of the future, and then go and come back and sell them to us. So we need to stop looking at ourselves as, uh, as 54 separate countries, and for once look at ourselves as one unit that can work together to solve the problems that we have, and then export the solutions. So collective funding, uh, collaboration across all the 54 countries, and really at the end of the day if uh, we need to stop overly focusing on who takes the credit for what okay and just get it done you've been watching the cnbc africa special on the world science day my name is arnold quizera from kigali rwanda you can follow us on twitter at cnbc africa and you can tweet me directly at the real quizera have a blessed day